Welcome to discipleship class number five. So now what we're going to do is that we're going to just very briefly, very briefly review through practice soul winning again. And then what we're going to do is that I'm going to, in this teaching, I'm going to explain to you your homework assignment when you watched History of Bible Believers. So in history of Bible believers, it is very important for your own spiritual maturity and attending Bible believing churches. If you don't learn anything out of t today's lesson, then you're not going to do well. So it is very important to understand that. So first, let's uh, practice through our soul winning. So we're going to go through th the basic steps again. So again, what are the basic steps? The basic steps, remember, is you do the intro. I taught you how to do that. Then you do Romans 3.23, making them realize that they've sinned. Then you do Revelation 21.8, making them understand the penalty of sin is a burning hell. Romans 5.8, you explain to them about the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And don't forget to include that he's God. And Romans 5.9 is where you explain the importance of that story why he died, buried, and resurrected, because his blood washes away our sins. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you make them realize that their good works cannot save them. Then in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, you make them understand the importance of repentance for salvation. And then Romans 10, 9, you get them to understand that if they believe the whole gospel, everything they've heard so far, the gospel, then all they have to do is say it to the Lord. And then you do the conclusion. So I taught you the catches on how to get them say it to God, the sinner's prayer. And then after you do that, then you're done. So these are the tips and the keys on what you should do to be able to witness in soul winning. And then uh, concerning about uh, what everyone's going through in their minds right now is this, is that, okay, what about certain uh, arguments that a person may bring up in the middle of my soul winning? Uh, what do I do after I get them to do the sinner's prayer? Um, what do I, how do I get them to grow spiritually? Because I just don't want them to get them saved. I want them to spiritually grow, that too. I don't want them to think that they're just saved and that's it. And uh, some people might ask, uh, what, how about assurance of salvation, etc.? Look, all those things is not to today's focus. That's why I've given, I'm making this class as easy as possible. And I've given you plenty of time to do practice soul winning. So if you were loafing all this time, that's not a time to loaf. I deliberately gave you all this time to keep practicing and practicing, and you got to do it through audio. So I want online people especially especially to do audio. It's very tempting you're not doing it when I can't listen to your audio, the online members, but you have to do it. The reason why I'm asking you to do audio, so here's something you might want to understand. This might be helpful to you when you go through basic to advanced discipleship. So this is an important note you want to know. It's important to audio record yourself. Why? The reason why it's important to audio record yourself is so that you can see clearly what your mistakes are. You don't know your mistakes until you actually see it for yourself. You might have everything in your head and nailed it down perfectly, but it comes to nothing if you don't see the result of what you knew in your head. You have to see the result in your head, and trust me, it's different from how you picture in your mind when you listen to it on audio. And the evidence is me, because what I teach online, it looks very different on video than what I picture in my mind. So that's why it's very important to audio record yourself. So don't just, this is good advice for you guys, don't just audio record yourself and do these soul winning things when I ask you to do it. In homework assignments do it yourself too do it occasionally yourself in soul winning when you're preparing a preaching when you're preparing a teaching advanced disciples and beginners disciples I make them all audio record themselves all of them because that way they can catch themselves easily okay so let's do practice in discipleship 
real quickly. And then uh, after that, then we will, uh, I will explain about the history of the Bible believing movement. Uh, hi, so it's not to scare you, we're not Jehovah Witness or Mormon or trying to sell you anything. Uh, we're just going around the neighborhood with uh, free comics that happen for you here, if you like. Mm, uh, thank you. Uh, so that we're not strangers, my name is Robert. Uh, what's your name? Gene. Gene, how you doing? Pleasure to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Uh, so Gene, I have uh, just one quick question for you, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you could go to heaven? No, I'm not 100% sure. Okay, okay, that, that's fine. Well, the Bible says here in uh, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short to the glory of God. So do you know what sin is, Gene? No, I don't know what sin is. Okay, so sin is uh, anything you've done in your body that's bad. Have you sinned, Gene? Sure, I've sinned before. Okay, and uh, that, that's fine, uh, Gene, we've all sinned. Uh, here it says in the Bible, in uh, Revelation 21.8, uh, But the fearful, the unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So, Gene, because of your sins, that's why you can't go to heaven, and your punishment is a burning hell, okay? Mm. But see... Do you know the story of Jesus? No, I don't know the story of Jesus. <laughs> so You know what? I don't think I turned mine off either. <laughs> oh, I'm guilty too, brother. Let me turn this off quickly. Yeah. Alright, go ahead, brother. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. So, um, so the story of Jesus is uh, Jesus is God. He lived up in heaven. Um, he became a man like you and I. He lived on earth for 33 and a half years without committing any sins. And then men who were jealous of him, they uh, charged him on phony charges, and they had him crucified, and then he was buried, and then he raised himself from the dead and went to heaven, and now he is in heaven. Okay? Mm. So uh, that's shown here in Romans 5, 8 through 9. And it says, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him right so the wrath we read about in Revelation 21 8 okay mm -hmm. but see one more point to understand here in, for salvation is uh, in Ephesians 2 8 for by grace are ye saved through faith and not of that not of yourself it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So see, it's uh, not your good works that are going to get you to heaven. It's not your church attendance. It's not uh, the water baptism or any good thing that you do that's going to get you to heaven. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? Mm -hmm. and, and the Bible also says, um, so once you understand that, uh, in 2 Corinthians 7.10, it says, uh, For godly sorrows worketh repentance uh, to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So, um, repentance is uh, being sorry for your for your sinful state. Us, uh, Gene, are you sorry for being a sinner? Yeah, sure. Yes. Okay. Okay. So then, if you're sorry for being a sinner, and um, you, you can accept that that uh, you have sinned before, then the Bible says all you have to do is call out to God and let Him know that, and that's here in Romans. Not, um, not 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So, uh, Gene, um, that, that's all you got to do. All you have to do is say it out to God. So how about it, Gene? Would you be willing to say it in under 15 seconds to tell God that you believe the gospel? I'll even give you the words. All you have to do is repeat after me. How about it? Are you willing to tell God that you believe the gospel? Sure. Okay, okay, praise God. Uh, so the, the only thing is, um, uh, the words that you are going to repeat after me, those words um, and the prayer itself are not what saves you. This is just you telling God that you believe the gospel, right? And I'm just here to witness it all, okay? So, Got it. Okay, okay, wonderful, wonderful. So, um, okay. dear God, dear God, I repent. I repent. As a sinner, as a sinner, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that's okay, man. Oh, I believe. I believe 
Jesus. Jesus is God. Is God. Who 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 died died buried buried and and resurrected resurrected. So so his blood his blood can wash can wash away away my sins my sins. So I so I only trust only trust in in the the blood blood alone alone to save to save and and not my not my good works good works save me save me from hell from hell in jesus in jesus name name i pray i pray amen 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 all right amen. i was Thank too you. juiced i'm sorry i got really juiced with <laughs> that's, that. okay. that's okay <laughs> i was like going to a cadence i'm sorry i was really okay, okay so then let's do it again one and um amen. you don't have to do it like one word at a time yes sir do it so uh think about it use as many words as you think that you can that a person will be able to hear clearly and be able to repeat after you okay Got it. it can be it can even be big clue it can even be as big as five five words oh wow. five five or six words but it depends on how you feel that the person may understand okay uh -huh. okay all righty all right so let's do this all right okay ready dear God dear God I repent I repent as a sinner as a sinner I believe I believe Jesus is God Jesus is God who died who died buried and buried and resurrected resurrected so his blood so his blood can wash away can wash away my sins my sins so I only so I only trust trust in the blood in the blood alone to save alone to save That's one. and <laughs> and not my good works not my good works save me from hell save me from hell in jesus name in jesus name i pray i pray amen amen, amen. hey no. don't don't worry about that okay <laughs> when you're doing the prayer mm -hmm. with the people you don't have to worry about you know if it sounds bad you know the point is the person is focusing in repeating after you see okay. they might they might catch something a little weird here and there, but it's not a big deal because the person's focusing on repeating after you. Gotcha. So don't let that bother you. Yeah. Okay. The only th uh, the thing that's more important is what you were focusing just now, like trying to say as many words as possible, in a way where a person can be able to remember to repeat after and, you. And, and yeah. also, I, I mean, I try to like you know, Jesus is God. You know, mm -hmm. like, well, my sins. You know, like. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like, I try to highlight. Things, yeah, that way a person can understand when he's repeating after you exactly that, how important those words are. Correct. Yes. yes. So, so it I is. Find a better one. Yes, because it is important to understand. I had several. I had a few actually, where I had them in the middle of doing prayer, but then when it came to Jesus is God, and they repeat after me, and we kept going, the person stopped me actually. I was like, oh, and then the person explained to me. So then I have to believe Jesus is God, and then. I explained to them that it is important because in the uh, the book of Acts, when the when you're trusting in the blood, we gotta realize it's God's blood in Acts chapter 20. Yeah. So then that's why um, it was a good thing that we mentioned to the people that repeating words don't save you. You gotta make sure you understand what you're saying and you're believing in every word. See, so what you when you mark those things down, that is good. That is important. So I said all these things to give you a heads up that that does happen actually. Okay. You might get someone in the middle of prayer who may not believe those things you marked actually. So it's a good thing. All right. Now that we've been through practicing through our soul winning, and uh, you've also heard some of the suggestions that I gave to improve yourself. That way you can get a better idea in case people online also make that same mistake. So now that we've gone through all of that, now I'm going to go through you one of the most important, if not the most important thing you need to hear to see major spiritual maturity in your life. Okay, so you watched History of Bible Believers, I assume. If you haven't yet, you better watch it before I explain this part. Because when you watch that video, it is definitely one of the most life-changing things you will ever hear. So in history of Bible believers, we got to understand this. Ever since Jesus and the apostles started, okay, we got to realize this. That the early Christians, 
they went through a lot of wrong doctrine. That is important to understand. Because you had Alexandria, Egypt, with its false Bibles and philosophical and Gnostic doctrines that was mixed up. What did Paul say? Paul even said that in the book of 2 Thessalonians, as well as the book of Colossians, that there were these Gnostic and false doctrines coming in. John even warned to the seven churches at his time that there were the deeds of the Nicolaitans, uh, the doctrine that, of that woman Jezebel, coming in the churches. Now think about this. Ever since Jesus and the apostles died out and you had all these Gnostic doctrines coming in, okay? You got Gnostic and heretical doctrines, whatever they were, mixed up with Alexandria. Think about it. From here all the way to the time of, let's say, the founding of the Catholic Church, so to speak, when it became official, the Catholic Church, as you notice from the video, History of Bible Believers, it, does, it just didn't come out in one day. It took gradually because it was fighting against right doctrine and these kind of doctrines. And they were cleaning out and trying to figure out what was the right doctrine at that time. There is no doubt if you study church history, church fathers, right? Now, I listed a few of them as good, actually, in our history of Bible believers. and then, But mostly I mentioned them as a bad thing. Because these church fathers were responsible for bringing in Catholic church doctrine. But hey, let's not be too hard on them because some of them uh, suffered a martyr's death better than we could. And number two, we also got to understand this. Uh, these church fathers at that time, because they were fighting against these kind of doctrines and there were so many councils and debates and going back and forth, it's so bad that you, they didn't have the luxury of knowing all the right doctrine like you do today. See, we had so many Bible-believing teachers and preachers and scholars throughout hundreds of years of history that cleaned up all the wrong doctrine and brought us the right doctrine today you gotta understand these church fathers didn't have that kind of luxury of technology easy access concordances like you and i do today so but i'm not justifying them because some of them were actually really wrong messed up apostate and basically downright evil like one example is origin he's definitely a person i do not approve period and by the way, he came from Alexandria. But I can also mention other church fathers as well. But see, when you look at this time period, okay, up to the Catholic Church, let's say the, the Catholic Church officially came out, it would be probably safe to say maybe like around 1100, okay? That's extremely early, okay? So let's do that. From the timeline of Jesus to 11100, how many years passed? See that? Look at this timeline gap from, let's put this right here as 100 AD. And that's being very, very generous for all the right doctrines, which wasn't at that time. They were still struggling. 100 AD to 1100, that's about 1,000 years, isn't it? Now think about this. During 1,000 years, do you honestly believe that the Christian church is not going to ha uh, get confused with a lot of wrong doctrine. You had that large time gap. Not only that, Christians were getting martyred and persecuted. They were hiding manuscripts at time. They did not have the luxury like you and I did watching YouTube videos or having a King James Bible freely right in front of our hands, a concordance and a word search uh, other Bible believing teachers who had the knowledge no we were all they were all too busy for 1,000 years running away for their lives and trying to serve God so that's why you gotta understand this the true line of Bible believing Christians is not perfect that is extremely important to understand there were a lot of wrong doctrines why because Look at this timeline gap. Come on. 
And don't be too hard on these early Christians because a lot of them loved Jesus, sacrificed their husband, wives, and children more than you and I would. So why would God do that? So this is an important thing. Why wouldn't God give them all of right doctrine at that time period? Because you got to understand this. What you got to understand is that God, He knows at which certain time periods what they really needed. Now you got to understand this. During this time period, what they needed to hear was not about the King James Bible issue. Neither about dispensationalism or a pre-tribulation rapture or about uh, the heresy of replacement theology, etc. That's not or how to debunk Jehovah Witnesses or how to debunk Calvinism. It wasn't that wasn't the important thing at that historical timeline. During this historical timeline, it was preserving his word, which is why we ended up with the King James Bible. During this timeline, it was maintaining the Christian faith against paganism that time. There's an important verse I want you to look at, Matthew 7. Now, this is something I want you to mark down and even memorize and apply in your life. If you don't apply this in your life, then you're going to have a nitpicky, critical attitude toward Bible-believing Christians just because they don't believe in certain doctrines like you believe. So this is extremely important to remember. Look at Matthew chapter 7. And verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their what? Fruits, ye shall know them. Now, verse 20 is the one I want you to mark down and memorize. But the whole context is 15 through 19. Wherefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, etc. The Holy Spirit will guide and lead us into all truth, right? So in order to be in the right crowd where the Holy Spirit is in it and where the Holy Spirit is moving see is by the fruits that's the key and when you look at history the fruits was definitely in this branch right here not on this branch right here this branch was the early Christians who went through suffering persecution so the fruits prove Bible believers. So when I say Bible believers, you got to understand, especially that title of that video, History of Bible Believers, they did not believe all the right doctrines like we did. What I mean by Bible believers is the, the certain fruits that the Lord used to eventually evolve us and to clean us and to purify and to perfect us more and more to what we are today. Because you got to understand this, even you and I today are not perfect Christians. Neither do we have all the knowledge of the Bible and all the knowledge of truth yet today. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says that we only know in part and prophesy in part. See, we only have, uh, the Lord guides us and leads us into all truth. The Holy Spirit will make sure he doesn't lead you down the wrong path. But you got to understand this. That doesn't mean God's going to give you every single thing that he knows. Because if he did, all of our minds would blow out. It's too much for us humans to handle. He will give us the way the Holy Spirit sees fit for you to produce the right kind of fruit. Because God knows which time period exactly what the people need. And what the people needed that time was preserving scriptures, preserving Christianity. Now... The Catholic Church, when they came out, we can see that they go down in this line right here. Because why? Well, now the fruits is rotten right here. How do we know that? Because this is no longer pagan Rome now. This is no longer uh, the Gnostic and the heretical kind of doctrines. What it's now coming into 
is the Catholic Church that took over the whole world and they were infiltrated with a bunch of wrong doctrine. Now this is very important to understand is that you have to keep looking at a group of people because what is a church? How you find the right church? Remember, no church is perfect. Everyone has flaws. But how you find the best kind of church that the church that within the line of fruits that the Holy Spirit is using, how you find that is what? The closest to the Word of God. The closest to what you see as the right kind of fruit that match with the Bible. Now think about this. Before the Catholic Church, this is before the Catholic Church, what's the best line you can think of? These early Christians. But now that the Catholic Church came out, what's the church that's the closer to the Bible, closer to the fruits? Definitely not the Catholic Church. As a matter of fact, Catholic Church became... It, it was getting really bad in doctrine. They were welcoming so many more pagan things, mixing it up, clouding it with Christianity, and they came up with their own wrong kind of Bible, and they even gave a wrong salvation, which is definitely enough that that's not the right kind of church. The right kind of church, church means called out assembly. So it's a group of people. It's not solo you. That's a problem with people, especially online. Especially online, you're all solo and you expect everybody to be like you, people online to be like you, churches to be like you, pastors to believe like you. No, when you're like that, you're not part of God's fruit of what he's using. He doesn't use solo. He uses a called out assembly. Why? Because, why? Because Jesus says that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. God uses a church. It's always a called out assembly for his glory. So if you're all by yourself out there, are you part of a called out assembly? And a called out assembly has to be united. We're all different. We're all imperfect. But God wants us united. That's what he wants. And that is extremely important to understand. Don't make everybody to your kind of belief and to your kind of level. If you do that, then you're going to learn very quickly how lonely it is you, for you out there. And that you're not part of a movement. It's always a movement, a group of people that the Lord uses fruits on. you got to understand. It's always some group of people. I'm not talking about big organizations, thousands, hundreds of people, stuff like that. I'm not talking about that. Jesus, even the Bible says we're going to be a minority. But guess what? Noah himself, when he went inside the ark, had seven people with him. There was some kind of So you have to have a group. You ha and a group has a what? It has a pastor. Always a pastor. Always. A church always has a pastor. God does not operate a church without a pastor. He doesn't work that way. He always has to have a pastor. So if it's just your buddies and your friends... See, that's not the group of people God's using. What he's using is men of God and pastors. So you got to think about this. you got to find the pastor and church, this combination together that's closest to the right kind of fruits and also closely to the Word of God. Now, from the Catholic Church and onward, we got the Reformation, right? And we also had before Martin Luther... We had Wycliffe, we had the Lollards, we had the Waldensians, etc., etc. All these different groups that oppose the Catholic Church. These guys we consider are the Bible believers. Now, why is that? Well, you can point out their wrong doctrine here and there and there. Sure, you can point out wrong doctrine here, there and there, but it doesn't change the fact they were the closer ones to God's sort of fruits, how he was moving and to also the Word of God. They were the closer ones. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because the Catholic Church had so much corruption inside it. <clears throat> During that time period, it had so much corruption. It also only made people read the Latin Bible rather than the Bible in their own language. 
So, and there were doctrines in the Catholic Church that these people opposed, which were right. So that's why these were the best group of people. So thus, these are the fruits undoubtedly God used. Why? How do you know that, preacher? Because there's no doubt. Look at history. Because of these people the Lord used during this time period of Reformation, Catholic Church fell apart and it's no longer the most powerful empire in the world. Now we reach to the KJV time period, right? When the King James Bible came out, we had what? The Great Awakening Revivals. Remember, these people still didn't have their doctrine straight. During the Reformation, they still had Catholic practices. That's important to understand. Martin Luther, he still did some Catholic practices. The, some people during the Reformation still practiced sprinkling babies. Uh, there was Calvinism seeping in. That is a bad heretical doctrine, actually. There was um, uh, Martin Luther. He was even uh, he was even saying about burning up Jewish synagogues. That's what replacement theology. They keep using Martin Luther's line to support their doctrine. See, that's what these people resort to. But you gotta understand this. During this time period, what was the focus? The focus was not all the right doctrine like you and I today. It was what? Attacking the Catholic Church. This timeline was preserving the scriptures and Christianity. This timeline was attacking the Catholic Church. That's how God used these people. So that's why we would consider these were the right Bible believers. Why? Because during this timeline, this is the kind of fruit that brought us closer to the Word of God, was attacking the Catholic Church. Now, during the Great Awakening revivals, there were people who were still messed up in doctrine. There was uh, some sorts of Calvinism seeping in all over. But you got to realize this. The focus of the Great Awakening that time was missions. It was missions and it was revivals. That was the goal of this time period. So it was spiritual awakening, cleaning up sin, and getting right to live for Jesus Christ. But you got to realize this. Ever since the beginning to now, that doesn't mean we were evolving in knowing more and more right doctrine. That's important to realize. You can't be part of a group that's not evolving more and more in right doctrine. You got to be part of a, now I'm not saying solo you again, or your certain people. It's got to be a called out assembly and pastor. Called out assembly and pastor. Called out assembly and pastor. A called out assembly and pastor that was evolving more and more in right doctrine, closer to the Bible. It doesn't change that fact. So you always have to be a part of that group. If not, then you're going to be part of a called out assembly and pastor that will not grow more closer to right doctrine and that's why their spiritual life won't be growing more. Because the job of a Christian, no matter who you are, is to become more perfect like Jesus Christ. You can't stop or be content. If you stop or be content, that's a major problem and the devil can use that, which is what he did. In today's day and age, he used those kind of people. Now I'm going to explain a little bit more on that one. But during this timeline, they were evolving more in right doctrine. In fact, it was during this timeline that we started to learn more and more of the foundation of dispensationalism. And then as well as uh, the King James Bible issue. As well as other doctrines. Growing more and more in doctrines. Right doctrines. Now what happened now is that we reach today, modernism. What's going on right here? Well, what's going on as you studied in the video, so now we see this branch, right? Okay, here came out the fundamentalist, independent fundamental Baptist church, aka fundamentalist, or also known as IFB. This is our group, our root in history, you gotta understand, because the focus of that time, you gotta understand, was attacking modernism. Thus we know this is the right kind of fruits and this is uh, the right group of people. We know that for a fact. Because they were the ones attacking all the modernism in churches that time. 
uh, standing for the main fundamental right doctrines that time. That's why uh, with a lot of fundamentalist Baptist pastors, I listen to them. Great, great people, uh, enjoyable. Curtis Hudson, uh, you also got John R. Rice, B.R. Lakin, Jack Hiles, and you have tons of people that, I mean, these people, there's no doubt, men of God, the Lord used. Men of God, the Lord used. You can find a lot of dirt on them, okay? Especially Hiles. Hiles, he has a lot of some creepy things too, okay? But you got to understand this. The thing you got to understand is that there's no doubt this is the kind of group of people the Lord used that time. Why? Because this is the group that was closer to the Bible, closer to the fruits, the right kind of fruits of the Holy Spirit at that time period. I didn't say today. I said that time period. Now, from this branch came Bible believers, what we call ourselves today, Bible believers. This branch through our history, what happened is it's a combination, culmination of dispensationalism, the King James Bible issue, as well as learning more and more doctrine. The IFB fundamentalists, they refuse to do that. That is their problem. The problem is, is that their problem, so we see a lot of fundamentalist Baptist churches around our world today. But what they would refuse to do is study the book. That is a major problem. So because they refused to study, this modernism was able to eat them up. Because in modernism, these guys were studying. See, educated schools were studying more. That's why a lot of Christians are falling away to higher education into wrong, doc uh, wrong doctrine, wrong belief. Because they're eating up the IFB. Cults are eating up the IFB, fundamentalists. Not only that, heresies are eating up fundamentalists. So a lot of these people rejected fundamentalism and they go to these modern, watered-down, sissified, rock and roll, worldly, contemporary, uh, non-denominational, messed up doctrine churches. Fundamentalists, you understand, we believe in the main fundamental doctrines, but what distinguished us a lot is we are, we're not charismatic. We're also pre-trib. We're also KJV. These, and we're also especially non-worldly. These were the main highlights how God used the fundamentalist IFB to attack modernism that time. But because they refused to study the Bible more, these things, charismatics, now, you know I'm right. Look at the majority of Christians. How many of them seep into charismatic? How many of them seep into post-trib nonsense, amillennialism nonsense, who deny a pre-trib rapture? How many of them think different Bibles are okay? How many of them are becoming more worldly with their dressing and with their music? See that? So it was important that you have to study more, uh, more of the Bible. Thus came the Bible believers. I showed you the people who laid the foundation. C.I. Schofield Larkin for dispensationalism. You had Edward F. Hills and Dean Bergen for the King James Bible issue. And then you had the fundamentalists who knew these kind of issues, but they didn't advance these things more. So thus Dr. Ruckman, he combined this thing, and then he advanced it even more. And then other Bible believers that came out from Dr. Ruckman, we used this foundation to keep pushing these things and to make it more clear today. We study even more and more from what Dr. Ruckman laid, so now there are some things that we can discover that Dr. Ruckman did not discover in certain verses, and we can use these verses to expound these things even better now, with certain heavy doctrines with the King James Bible issue and dispensationalism. It's a matter of fact, from beginning of history to now, you have to evolve, you have to advance. That's a matter of fact. But remember this, it has to be united as a called out assembly with a church and pastor. The main flaw, this is why I want to emphasize this, the main flaw, I told you before, it is important to advance, but it is also important to stay united. 
when you advance and get out of unity, you will become not part of the fruits and the movement God has used from the beginning of history to now. You won't become part of that great movement. You got to realize this. This is a great movement we're involved with. We always attack this line, this movement, these fruits. From Alexandria, pagan Rome, to the Catholic Church, uh, to the big top elites and the cults religion, evolution, and uh, liberal schools, and uh, certain politics. And I explained all this other modernism, right? All these other modernism stuff from this line and this branch that the devil used. Who's going to attack these guys today? Come on. Who's going to stand up to these guys? It's this group of people. But unfortunately, people, they just want to keep studying in their own thing and refuse to stay united with the called out assembly, church, and pastor, but to keep studying on their own, advance in their own way. And here you got so many different people, different people who will contradict each other and they'll even fuss and fight about stupid little things in, because they have their own doctrine that they set up. And that is actually even a cult mentality, which is dangerous. It becomes your own religion, own cult, because you're not part of a traditional line that the Lord used, but a recent line that you yourself only created. That is extremely important to understand. That's the reason why I stress this so much, because YouTube is so guilty of doing that. Social media is so guilty of doing that. And yes, even Bible believers who have no access to technology, they're guilty of that. I've seen this too many times in the Bible school I attended. Because we have such a wealth of knowledge, that pride seeps in where we study in our own little thing and then we start to correct Bible-believing preachers and teachers and pretty soon we find out that we're practically the only minister or especially big ministers that the Lord has used throughout history to promote our kind of teaching. And God don't use those kind of people. That's pride. That's pride. Are you saying, Pastor, that I should agree everything with those Bible-believing pastors and churches, remember the very first class I taught you? No, that's not the case. The thing is this, Romans 14, you should, you know what, that's going to be your homework assignment. Read Romans chapter 14, Romans 14. And all of you should seriously pray and read that chapter. What you should be doing is that you can't judge your brother and sister in Christ. you got to realize this, to... It's between him and God. And trust me, you don't know all the details. Perhaps that person's heart is right with God, the one that you're correcting. It, his heart is right with God, and guess what? If you judge that, the Lord will judge you severely on what you did wrong on that. Oh, no, I'm right. I know I'm right. Oh, trust me, everyone thinks like that. I know I'm right. I thought that way, too. There were doctrines that Bible believers taught. I had a hard time agreeing. But I was wise to shut my mouth about it because I was thinking right here, you know what, I don't want to go against a movement, a called out assembly, church and pastor that the Lord was using. Because there might be something I misunderstood. Or maybe they were wrong about it, but overall they were right actually. And guess what? It turned out right every time. I want to give that kind of warning to people out there. Every time it turned out to be right. So that's a big warning. Because you got to realize this. If God is in a called out assembly that's united with church and pastor, don't you think that you should be very careful before you touch the Lord's anointed? What Lord God has ordained? What God has used? And guess what? Who does God anoint? Who does God use? Who does God ordain? Imperfect sinners like you. He never uses a perfect person. So I hope you understand that. This is extremely important, and that's why I'm, I stress so much, you got to go to a Bible-believing church. Go find a Bible-believing church. We have our resources link. You heard me say that over and over again. Click on our resources link, and then you'll find a Bible-believing church directory. If you can't find one, then go to the next kind of best movement, next kind of best group. What is that? Right here. Fundamentalist churches, they're all over the world, these fundamentalists. They're widespread, IFB. Go to those kind of churches. Now, I also want to give a warning, though. The kind of fundamentalist churches you shouldn't go to, though, because some of them have fa really fallen into apostate. They're not traditional like back then. 
Some of them are becoming worldly. Some of them are inviting charismatic stuff. Some of them are not pre-trib anymore. Some of them are not KJV. If you go to those fundamentalist churches, you should avoid them. You should avoid them. They fall into apostasy. We weren't like that back then. Okay, so go to here, and if it doesn't work out, then go to this one. Go to this one. And may the Lord bless and guide you into all truth. Heavenly Father, dismiss us now with your blessing with discipleship and bless the Bible study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great, then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.